This is Hearts Content, a small community in Trinity Bay on the island of Newfoundland. It's a quiet morning today, but more than a hundred years ago, thousands of people lined this waterfront to watch history being made. On July 27, 1866, the largest steamship on earth entered this port to lay down the final section of an underwater telegraph cable that stretched all the way back to Ireland. It connected Europe with North America. News that once took more than a week to travel by steamship could now arrive in minutes. And it was through the tiny fishing village of Heart's Content that some of the world's greatest cities now communicated. The telegraph was a marvel of modern technology, the 19th century equivalent of text messaging. This device sent electrical pulses racing across a wire. Telegraph operators pressed the knob down for a short time to create a dot and a longer time to create a dash. These dots and dashes formed an alphabet called Morse code. That was the language of the telegraph. The first commercial telegraph line began operating in 1844. It connected Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. A decade later, vast networks of telegraph lines connected much of North America and Europe. But communications between the two continents still had to travel across the Atlantic Ocean by steamship. It was about an eight-day journey if the weather was good. The laying of the Atlantic Telegraph Cable was the dream of two men, an American millionaire named Cyrus Field and a British engineer living in Canada named Frederick Gisborne. Gisborne was the first to become interested in the telegraph. In 1847, he spearheaded a plan to lay a line between Quebec and Halifax. Four years later, he decided to extend that line to Newfoundland Engineers in Europe had recently laid a cable across the English Channel, so Gisborne knew that technology existed to lay another one beneath the waters that separated Newfoundland from Nova Scotia. His plan was to wire the island and then plug it into the North American grid. Gisborne found wealthy investors for his plan in New York. He also received support from the Newfoundland government. On September 2nd, 1851, Gisborne began the Herculean task of surveying the telegraph route by foot. He was accompanied by six other men. They spent three back-breaking months exploring Newfoundland's southern interior, looking for a route that the telegraph line could take through the rugged and largely undeveloped landscape. Hunger and exhaustion were persistent problems. October 27th, wind west-southwest, blowing a gale. Cleared up at 7.30 a.m. We again drew lots for the bread, there being but six biscuits for each man, and our venison near out. As Hare Bay Brook, a considerable stream at all times, was now a river, we set to work at the raft, and then two and two crossed over without accident. Ticklish work, this rafting business. On December 4th, Gisborne returned to St. John's, his long journey finally complete. Three months later, the St. John's to Carbonear line officially opened for business. But the project ran into serious financial problems in the summer of 1853, when its pot of money ran dry. Gisborne traveled to New York looking for more investors. In 1854, he met Cyrus Field, a self-made millionaire with a flair for business and a sense of adventure. Recently retired from a profitable venture in the paper industry, Field was looking for an exciting new project. He became interested in Gisborne's plan, but he had a grander vision. Instead of just connecting Newfoundland with Nova Scotia, Field wanted to build a cable that would extend all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and end in Ireland. If the project was successful, it would earn Field a second fortune and a permanent place in history. Gisborne had found himself a wealthy and enthusiastic supporter. Field attracted more investors to the project and work progressed quickly. 
By October 1856, the overland line from St. John's to Cape Ray had been built, as well as the submarine line to Nova Scotia. Gisborne's partnership with Field had certainly turned out to be a productive one, but it was far from peaceful. Conflict plagued their working relationship. When the Trans Island Line was complete, Gisborne left the project. Field pushed on. With Newfoundland firmly wired into the North American grid, the next step was to establish a European connection. It was an enormous challenge. Building an underwater cable that could span the ocean pushed the limits of 19th century science and engineering. To function underwater, the wire had to be coated in a rare and expensive material called gutta percha. It was a natural plastic that came from trees in Southeast Asia. At the center of Field's transatlantic cable were seven strands of copper wire which carried the electrical signal. They were coated in three layers of gutta percha. Then, a protective outer covering of iron wire had to be wound around the entire length of cable. The final product looked like this. Ten kilometers of wire weighed about eight tons. To make it across the ocean, the team needed 3,200 kilometers of wire. That would weigh a staggering 2,500 tons. No single ship existed on the planet that could carry such a load. Determined to see his plan come to fruition, Field turned to the United States and British navies. He asked each superpower for the loan of a single vessel, able to carry 1,250 tons. His plan was to cut the wire in two and divide it among the ships. Both navies said yes. On July 29, 1858, the USS Niagara and HMS Agamemnon met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Each ship was carrying half of the transatlantic telegraph cable. The two ends were spliced together and dropped to the sea floor. Then each vessel steamed off in opposite directions, all the while lowering telegraph cable into the waters. On August 4th, the Niagara arrived at Bull Arm in Trinity Bay, Newfoundland. One day later, the Agamemnon steamed into the port of Valencia, Ireland. From a house in Trinity Bay and a tent in Valencia, the world's first transatlantic telegraph messages were sent and received. Queen Victoria wired words of congratulations to the U.S. President James Buchanan. He replied that the telegraph symbolized a bond of peace between kindred nations. But the bond was short-lived. There were problems with the connection right from the start. The Queen's message had taken hours to arrive instead of minutes. As time passed, the connection grew weaker. Words became garbled, phrases lost in transmission. The telegraph line fell silent altogether 27 days after it started operating. After years of work and millions of dollars in investments, the continents were once again cut off. Although the project had used some of the most innovative technology of the day, that technology was largely untested. Most damaging of all were the excessively powerful batteries used to send the electric pulses across the wire. The voltage was so high that it burned a hole in the precious gutta percha needed to insulate the wire. The press dismissed the project as a fiasco. Some newspapers even said it was a hoax designed to bilk gullible investors out of their fortunes. None of this deterred Cyrus Field from his goal. He poured more of his own money into the project and secured even more investors. A new wire was manufactured and it improved upon previous mistakes. An extra layer of gutta percha was added to the core. So was a new waterproof insulating material called Chatterton's compound. And a new invention called the mirror galvanometer made it possible to detect low voltage signals. Field also decided that using two wires and two vessels introduced far too many risks. He wanted a single unbroken wire to span the Atlantic. Fortunately, by the time that new wire was ready in 1865, 
a mammoth new steamship existed that could carry the load. It was called the Great Eastern, and it was five times larger than any other vessel in the world. Weighing in at 19,000 tons and measuring 200 meters long, the vessel was a floating city. But its great bulk required an enormous harbor. Bull Arm was no longer suitable, so Field searched for another site. And he found it in the tiny fishing community of Hearts Content. Its harbor was wide enough and deep enough to accommodate the massive Great Eastern. On July 13, 1866, the vessel departed Valencia, Ireland on its extraordinary mission. One of the passengers on board was John C. Dean of the Anglo-American Telegraph Company. He recorded the journey in his diary. Tuesday, July 24th. Breakfast at 8, lunch at 1. Dinner at 6, tea at 8. 502 souls who live on board this huge ship following their prescribed occupations. Cable going out merrily. Electrical tests and signals perfect. And this is the history of what has taken place from noon yesterday to noon today. May we have three more days of such delightful monotony. It rained very hard during yesterday evening. And as we approach the banks of Newfoundland, we get thick and hazy weather. At daybreak on July 27, 1866, the Great Eastern arrived at Hearts Content. Thousands of people were waiting on shore. They had come from across Newfoundland, Canada, and the United States to watch the mighty steamer and its historic cargo arrive at the village. It took 50 men to pull the cable ashore, and one of them was Cyrus Field himself. They brought it into the telegraph station and wired it into the grid. A permanent connection was finally established between Europe and North America. Hearts Content will awaken to the fact that it is a highly favored place in the world's esteem, the western landing place of that marvel of electric communication with the eastern hemisphere, which is now happily, and we hope finally, established. The cable was a success. It carried about 1,000 messages a month at up to $10 a word. By 1894, five more cables connected Newfoundland to Ireland. Commercial, political, and social messages sped across the ocean and throughout the continents. And at the center of it all was a tiny community named Hearts Content. Although the cable station stopped operating in 1985, it is still open to the public as a heritage site. Inside, visitors can see rooms of telegraph equipment. Outside, they can see the transatlantic telegraph cables themselves, slender conduits that were once responsible for wiring the world. <laughs>